Well, good afternoon. It's delightful to be with you today. And I've had a series of wonderful conversations with uh, colleagues here in the EDRC across the university. Well, my plan is to ask you to join me in a journey across a particular landscape. And this landscape begins, for those of you who may not be familiar with, the context for concerns about research in American Indian Alaska Native communities. Uh, and movement through the federal government's uh, increasingly formal codification of the way in which, at least in principle, it should relate to Native communities, which has not typically uh, been uh, well implemented in practice, but increasingly so. And move you through up to what I think are some of the major benchmarks and points that underscore the challenges with respect to precision medicine and notably the All of Us Research Program. We'll talk a little bit about how the Human Genome um, Project and initiative emerged within this um, growing uh, context uh, of concern among Native communities, uh, some of the trials and tribulations it posed uh, for both. Uh, the federal government as well as tribal communities. The challenge that it posed for Dr. Collins, who uh, was remarkably uh, open in learning a number of the lessons uh, that uh, led to this new approach through the All of Us Research Program. And then I'll take you into the All of Us Research Program. Um, finally, after about two and a half years, I think we're getting closer and closer to reaching some points where we can move on in this particular agenda. I unfortunately am embargoed from sharing some of the particulars with you, uh, given the sensibilities of the federal government and the involvement of attorneys. And, um, and then I'm gonna end though with what I think are at least five or six major scientific challenges, because I'm gonna move beyond, uh, beyond the, the process and the broader uh, set of issues that are challenging such initiatives. I wanna talk about some of the science and the scientific challenges. And I had a great conversation with Tom and both Toms uh, earlier today and Paul Crane about some of those challenges. And uh, um, they really do um, shape uh, the possibilities of the science for us as uh, fellow investigators as well as my um, peers in our community. So that's my plan for today. So let me move you quickly uh, into two major studies that heightened attention within American Indian Alaska Native communities with respect to research generally that then set the stage for uh, these current initiatives. The first was the Barrow Alcohol Study, um, taken place, as the name implies, in Barrow, Alaska, in which there was a putative epidemiologic study of alcohol abuse and dependence among the residents in that community uh, with a particular focus on its Alaska Native uh, members of that community. Um, on the heels of that report entitled the Inuit, uh, Inupiat Economics and Alcohol in the Alaska North Slope, uh, we saw uh, a series of articles uh, in the 1980s and through the out that year, not the least of which was out of the New York Times that ran a front page story entitled Alcohol Plagues Eskimos. And the immediate con consequence of this particular study and its airing in the public was to drop the um, bond rating uh, of Barrow, Alaska from a double A to a C plus and absolutely constrained for the next decade any kind of local development on behalf of the residents, native and non-native in that community. So you can imagine not only the economic consequences, but the stigma that associates with this. It was talking about rates of alcoholism of 72 percent uh, among the 2,000 uh, Native men and women who lived in this community. As you dug down into the science, you found that the fact that science was faulty, uh, that in fact uh, they were, uh, it was rift with a number of the classic epidemiologic mistakes. Uh, and it continued to resonate uh, in terms of its economic consequences, not only for Barrow itself, for, but for the development of oil and the extraction industries uh, throughout the area. The second major one, probably more widely known to the general public, had to do with the Havasupai, Havasupai tribe in Arizona State University. 
In this particular case, uh, there were a series of investigators from Arizona State University who had collaborated with the Havasupai tribe in gathering um, biospecimens and a wide spectrum of different kinds of psychosocial information from tribal members. It was ostensibly a study about diabetes and diabetes care and how to improve the nature of preventive and treatment approaches um, with respect to a condition of great concern to the Havasupai particularly as well as to native people generally given the epidemic proportions th that we struggle with. Um, and in fact, what occurred was is during a university lecture, uh, a student in class actually saw the pedigree of her family displayed up on the uh, board by the lecturer and was stunned because the lecture was about um, um, two, two subjects. One was ancestry and migration, and the other was trying to understand the risks of schizophrenia, neither of which were the, within the purview of the original study itself. So you can imagine not only the individual and personal impact of that particular discovery in the part of the student, but as she went back to her community and shared this with um, family members and the leadership, how it resonated throughout the the community and so that we in fact actually saw in Phoenix Magazine the title Arizona's Broken Arrow did Arizona State University genetically rape the Havasupai tribe and in fact this particular headline is mild compared to many of the other headlines that appeared at this point in time uh, in the media. It led to uh, a whole series of articles and ultimately a court case that was settled out of court at the very last minute in which Arizona State University um, undertook a financial settlement with the Havai Supai. But these two incidents are one of many, just probably the most publicly known, that have rippled across uh, tribal communities over the last 30 to 40 years and inevitably figure in to the conversations and the discourse that we have when we talk about undertaking research with American Indian Alaska Native communities. Now, what's the broader federal context for this? Many people, for example, think of American Indian Alaska Natives as simply one of a series of racial and ethnic groups in this country. I'm here to tell you that we do not think of ourselves for the most part in those terms. We think of ourselves as members of domestic dependent sovereignties, as nations within a nation, whose status is defined by treaty, largely from the late 1800s, with the federal government that in exchange for a variety of resources, our land um, and the other things that, uh, th that are part of that land, for the federal government's commitment to us the long term in terms of providing educational support, economic development, social services, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it was an exchange and that we are domestic dependent sovereignties. And I will come back to this as an interesting challenge when we think about some of the scientific questions before us as we consider genetics and the All of Us research program. But it was President Reagan initially who really took uh, the initiative to acknowledge uh, the special status that Ameri federally recognized American Indian Alaska Native uh, reservations and tribal communities hold vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. It was subsequently ratified, uh, by, uh, ratified by uh, George W. H. Bush, uh, who followed thereafter in a variety of executive orders and codified in law. This was reaffirmed by President uh, Bill Clinton uh, in another executive order in the early 1990s, in which it re uh, underscored the relationship of tribal governments to the federal government and actually stipulated the importance of undertaking a government-to-government -government consultation pro process, really just as it would with a, a consultation process with another uh, sovereignty outside of the United States. At that point in time, um, we then began to see a series of structures and institutional um, uh, initiatives begin to emerge. We saw, for example, uh, the emergence of institutional review boards um, within tribal communities themselves. The Indian Health Service is one of the major entities through the Public Health Service that's responsible for uh, initially organizing, funding, and delivering care to American Indian Alaska Native communities, specifically federally recognized tribes. Um, and it itself, the Indian Health Service, has a National Institutional Review Board that's responsible for providing such review approvals and monitoring of all research conducted 
uh, in any tribal jurisdiction that involves the resources of the Indian Health Service, a facility, people, or uh, records, anything of that nature. And so we began to see this proliferation of institutional review boards. Uh, the Navajo Nation, the Cherokee Nation, Oklahoma, the Chickas Chickasaw, Choctaw Nations, the Oglala Sioux Tribes are were early models that emerged, each slightly different from one another, um, but became the templates by which other tribal communities around the country began to grapple with these kinds of issues and to take responsibility as a part of self-determination uh, as a domestic dependent sovereignty for providing such oversight. Interestingly enough, more than just what an institutional review board might be, many of these boards also uh, had as a part of their function um, not just oversight, but uh, the provision of technical assistance and an interpretive um, contribution to the science. And I will tell you that our work at our centers has benefited enormously uh, from uh, that uh, technical assistance and insight and understanding in ways we might not otherwise, what are the broader co context and implications and ways of understanding the results of our work. Um, so, uh, but there's an interesting tension between these tribal um, governance structures and institutional review boards and the academy, universities, and the federal government. And let me talk in a, for a moment about these tensions. So again, this same set of, uh, of provisions were ratified by George W. Bush, uh, again uh, by Barack Obama, who was one of the first presidents to actually go and spend time on a, on a federally recognized reservation, specifically the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation that straddles North and South Dakota. This flow of effort on the part of the federal government resulted in an increasing uh, sensitivity to, sorry, there's something coming out of that. Uh, so we went past the development and the evolution of these institutional review boards and community review entities into actual procedures, protocols, and practices for undertaking tribal consultation. The Indian Health Service was among the very first that took seriously this tribal consultation process within a government-to-government -government framework, followed shortly by the Department of Education, the Department of Justice, and uh, ultimately the Department of Health and Human Services, although late to the table, developed a series of documents that were intended to provide this kind of guidance to its various agencies. So what I'd like to do now is share with you my assessment and way of understanding some of the points of contention and schism between universities and, and government, federal government notably, and tribal communities. We've seen this in the context of individuals, for example. People have talked about uh, an American Indian view of the world from the point of view of an individual and how that might vary from their counterparts in other cultures. I've taken sort of the similar kind of logic uh, but applied it uh, in three different contexts, one an organizational one, one a political one, and one in cultural terms. And so in each case, I've tried to illustrate for you what I believe, based upon my experience, are the, uh, the nature of the uh, assumptions and ways of viewing the world in actual practice that characterize universities and federal government and contrast them with those in tribal communities. And they are differences that have enormous implications for the ability to negotiate uh, agreement and to find common ground between these kinds of institutional organizations. So for the most part, um, I'm sure the University of Washington is very different from all the other universities. Uh, I can tell you that the University of Colorado is not necessarily. But universities in the federal government, I think for the most part, um, they see decision making as hierarchical and rule driven. It's codified. The process emphasizes efficiency, replicability, and written documentation. Leadership is formal. It's centralized. It's often without consideration of context. The thinking is analytic, which is very pr prominent. It assumes for the most part that there is an answer to any given issue or problem. And there is a keen emphasis on instrumental competence, highly valued, and it's the basis by which success is assessed within universities 
and the federal government. In sharp contrast, in tribal communities, decision making is often horizontal. It's precedent oriented and it's frequently consensual. The process is fluid. It's iterative, it's recorded orally, it's benchmarked by key events. It's not necessarily on a chron chronological ruler, if you will. Leadership is frequently shared. It's diffused and ascribed rather than attributed. And the emphasis is on a distributive way of thinking um, and assumes that there may be multiple answers to any given problem, however it might be defined. And ultimately, authority is rooted in this notion of collective competence that through, consen uh, through consensus and through discussion and reaching a common of narrative or discourse, the, co uh, the, co the competence of the decision makers will emerge collectively. Turning for a moment to political differences, there are enormous differences between universities and the federal government and tribal communities. So in universities and the federal government, Representation is typically, it's a collective of individuals or individual constituents or organizations. What's its objective? Its objective is to govern or to control those individuals and groups. Competence stems from delegated authority, from the president to the dean to a chair, et cetera, from the governor to a mayor, et cetera. Accountability is couched in terms of blameworthiness and liability underscore liability. Obedience is achieved through instruction and compliance. And all the rewards and incentives, the expectations that surround these kinds of processes have these elements reflected in them. Among tribal communities, again in sharp contrast, representation is of an individual collective. It's of a body politic. The objective is to manage interdependent relationships. Authority is rooted in moral and social responsibility. Accountability is framed as an obligation to and accept others and acceptance by them of that obligation in a reciprocal fashion. And there's a search and an emphasis on conformity through an adherence to shared values, not codified roles, but shared values. And thirdly, the struggle to find a common ground often proceeds in the context of cultural differences. So in the non-tribal world generally, it tends to be egocentric, focused on the individual. It prizes privacy and anonymity. It emphasizes majority opinion. It's frequently goal-driven or goal-directed. It emphasizes and values problem-solving and perceives time as a commodity, limited, and to be managed. We place a great deal of emphasis on that. And if you look at the Belmont Report in terms of human subject protections, you see all of those values embedded within it in terms of the assumptions that proceed. Now, in tribal communities, we tend to be sociocentric. That is that notion we, we are intersubjective in our sense of self and personhood rather than intrasubjective. We value very much and define our terms and are constantly working through our identities in the context of the others in our world. We seek cooperation. We try to de-emphasize conflicts. Now, some of you know that I'm married to Deidre Buchwald, who's German. Our son is German and American Indian. His biggest challenge in the world is figuring out how to be stoically aggressive. So it is this combination of trying to figure out how to navigate these different worlds and how to de-emphasize conflict. The tribal worldview stresses mutuality of belonging, of solidarity. We are very tolerant of differences and to a point. We actually prize differences as long as they're in service of the greater good. We encourage a common vision and the sharing of basic principles about how to construct our lives socially and collectively. And we tend to be cautious, deliberate, and patient. And we assume that events unfold and that there is a natural history to events that resist the inclination to push them along at a speedier point of resolution or progress. <laughs> 
So all these three major sets of differences, politically, organizationally, culturally, are at work as we come together searching for a common ground. What are some of the consequences in practical terms for us in pursuing a research agenda to which we can subscribe, we being broadly, universities, the federal government, and tribal communities? I just highlight here for you what I believe are some of the major ones. The first comes up with aligning the research agenda with local priorities. Frequently, the research that's done with American Indian Alaska tribal communities initiated often by colleagues in the federal government or the universities. And they come to us with a given idea. If they're astute at all and somewhat sensitive, they'll figure out the marketing aspects of this, but it's still their idea. There's relatively little in the way of soliciting from those communities themselves what their priorities are and trying to figure out the points of intersection or the mutuality of interest that may allow engaged, cooperative, collaborative research. It takes time. It takes money. It takes um, particular disposition. Tom Berman and I had a great conversation about that in his work with the Volga Germans around Alzheimer's disease and about how it takes a suspension of judgment. It takes resources. It takes really major dispositional control to um, uh, assert the, uh, the internal controls over your, in, your instinct to push things along as quickly as possible. Practical matters at issue have to do with the distribution of resources. What's in it for the tribal community in terms of the economics of this science? Not good enough just simply to say that, it, well, those, we don't have those resources. The federal government hasn't made them available, et cetera. The issue of, man, uh, of informed consent is a really fascinating one and it varies immensely among tribal communities. I don't know about you, I, actually I do because I've seen some of the University of Washington informed consent forms, but I can speak most pointedly about the University of Colorado forms. The language of those forms in terms of the um, attempt to um, constrain potential litigation leads almost to incomprehensibility in the part of most lay people and certainly the people in tribal communities. The other thing is, again, as in the Belmont report, it assumes that it all resides within the individual. Imagine, if you will, going to a Pueblo, as I did 30 years ago, working in a major epidemiologic study of American, of, of American Indian children in this Pueblo, and the Pueblo governor and council said, we give the, uh, the permission. Uh, for consent to do this work. You do not need the individual permission of our, of our Pueblo members. Imagine what challenge that posed for me negotiating that with our federal sponsors at NIH. It was very, very challenging. Ultimately, we ended up doing both. The, another one is the nation and extent of accountability and control. This is a really big one. This, for example, and we're wrestling with it as I'll share in a few moments in the All of Us program. So it's one thing to consider the uh, foregoing uh, four issues. But when you come to the pro point of the production of results and the manner in which they may be conveyed and the form that that may assume, whether it be posters, presentations, but particularly publications, the opportunity for tribal communities who have uh, per permitted this research to be undertaken in their, in their uh, particular jurisdictions to have not necessarily oversight and censorship, but input into the nature of the products themselves is frequently lacking. And it's a very big issue in tribal communities for lots of reasons, uh, going back to my earlier remarks. Dana ownership and, and sharing is another very practical matter. Who owns these data? You talk to the Navajo, their reservation is spiritually bounded by four uh, major mountains. They argue that the knowledge within the range of those four mountains is their possession. Suddenly be a student in a classroom at ASU and to see your family pedigree on a, on a slide and attributions about risk of schizophrenia is not the way to share results. And I think all of us would agree, but it is the most parsimonious example I have, together with the barrel alcohol study, of not, what not to do. People are, tribal communities are really vested in return on investment. 
I'll come back to that in a few moments because it is especially true in the context of the Human Genome Project and the All of Us uh, Research Program. What's the return for us? Oh, gee, 50 years of being told that we're going to be contributing to the greater good in terms of advancing the science? Well, that's not gotten us very far, either in terms of direct action or much less respect and honorifics about the way in which that's done. Maximizing tribal benefit. You know what? How can the products of this work? How can the knowledge acquired be applied in ways that are of benefit to the collective, to the tribal, tribal group, for its agreement to join with us as, a sci as scientists, universities, and other eyes? And there are expectations, expectations about continued collaboration. You've all heard the phrase uh, helicopter research or uh, the research sojourner. Uh, we expect, and don't we in our own lives, that there will be a sense of ongoingness, of longevity to the kind of relationships that we're building with one another around these kinds of things that is part and parcel of how these relationships should unfold. So, this is all before any of the work around uh, the Human Genome Project and the All of Us program, but it is the context in which the Human Genome Project arose. I'm assuming everybody knows about it. Perhaps some of us in this room weren't even born uh, in 1989, but major international initiative in which the United States played a central role in mapping the human genome. This particular effort ran afoul of virtually every major underrepresented racial and ethnic uh, group in the country. This gives you a flavor for how it was received in American Indian, Alaska Native communities. There was no consultation process. There was a general unidirectional information sharing, an invitation to join, but there was no true attempt at developing a partnership around this. And these are the kinds of things that arose. Matters talking about genetic material as cultural property. The Human Genome Diversity Pro Project, which ultimately never got off the ground, became known as the Vampire Project. We talked about indigenous peoples and gene disputes. The Navajo Nation itself actually at this point in time banned genetic research as a consequence of all of the backlash uh, and the violation of these basic uh, principles and practices and ended basically at this point in time the uh, project, the Human Genome Diversity Project, which ultimately never got off the ground. Now that doesn't mean that American Indian and Alaska Native people wholesale devalue research of this nature. There are many, many different perspectives. In fact, one of the big challenges, those of us who are Native as well as scientists working in these communities, is, fig is realizing that there isn't a single voice. The community says X, the community feels Y. There isn't a single voice, there are many. We're quite diverse in our perspectives, in our approaches and understandings of these matters. But it takes work to discover that variation in the perspectives and to seek out, listen to, invite, and develop the kinds of alliances that will move this agenda forward. So there is some great work here by the Strongheart Study, just as one major example around genetic studies uh, with respect to cardiovascular disease and, and diabetes and the like. So there is genetic research going on in Native communities and it reflects the diversity of opinions and value propositions that abound in those communities. What have been at this point in time now some of the emerging solutions on the heels of the Human Genome Project? There are several. So the, Dr. Collins, that Tom mentioned earlier, recognized that he, as the country's leader, to his credit, stepped up and expect, accepted responsibility, failed to take into account the deep-seated feelings that are present, not just in American and Alaska Native communities, but many different ethnic and racial communities. And he made a personal pledge as publicly to leadership from many tribes that he would 
try to do better with respect to the attempt to apply the findings from the human genome to future re research in NIH. What form did this take? It took several forms. It was articulated best in this letter uh, from the Department of Human Services, talking about the consultation process within the National Institutes of Health, recognized that that tribal, that government to government consultation process had not really unfolded and it was DHHS and the uh, NIH were really late in that process in embracing the consultation process. But he issued a letter acknowledging that. He established um, the Tribal Health Research Organization within his office, led by a Navajo scientist, uh, a basic scientist by the name of Dave Wilson. He also established a tribal advisory committee, a tribal advisory committee um, that um, is advisory to him and to the Tribal Health Research Office, and has a major information uh, initiative through that Tribal Health Research Office to better articulate the current state of the sponsorship and funding and distribution of research funded, supported by NIH across the country. And it has been a remarkable point of advocacy within the National Institutes of Health for advancing this particular agenda. What are some of the products? There are several different products. Uh, as a part of these emerging solutions. That's Dave Wilson together with the Navajo Nation. Uh, they actually hammered out a tribal data sharing agreement. Navigating many of the values and the differences in values that I sought to summarize earlier. And is rapidly advancing the Navajo Nation's reconsideration and probably in the near future um, uh, uh, ending of its moratorium on genetic research. And there are examples of data sharing groups uh, from Washington State University, Daedra's uh, own work and uh, NIH sponsored research um, and our joint work with another, the Seattle Indian Health Board right here, of articulating and codifying points of agreement about these tensions that I highlighted. What do they do? They illustrate that there are solutions to these kinds of things. If we are willing to invest the time and resources and demonstrate the patience and the respect to the process that's required for this. Now, enter the Precision Medicine Initiative in um, early 2015. Uh, full disclosure, as Tom was indicating earlier, Dr. Collins called me up and asked me to join uh, the commission to uh, generate this report. And uh, in a moment of rare disclosure, and uh, perhaps over a glass of wine with my spouse, I asked her, what's precision medicine? <laughs> and she, uh, as she is wont to do, did a wonderful job of educating him after she first said, what in the hell were they doing asking you to be on an initiative of this magnitude if you don't know what personal med uh, precision medicine is? Well, I'm an anthropologist. I've never been shy about trading into waters that I am uh, relatively uncertain if there are sharks lurking. And believe me, there are sharks in this water. It was actually a fascinating year-long experience. I actually finished the Office of Public Health. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's no accident that today the All of Us Research Program is now referring it to it as precision health as opposed to precision medicine, which is an interesting set of evolution of these um, ideas. So, the Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, the report went to President Obama in September of 2015. Uh, the All of Us Research Program was funded uh, out of Congress as a part of the 21st Century Cures Act um, and was off and running. What's its basic goals? for those of you not familiar with the All of Us Research Program. It basically has six primary goals. Uh, it revolves around the establishment of a cohort of a million or more volunteers, and this cohort is intended to grow over time, and that these participants in this cohort will um, provide a variety of information regarding um, various aspects of uh, their lifestyle, 
uh, environment and um, providing biospecimens for subsequent and genetic inquirement requirements. Um, there is a heavy emphasis on, particip on participant engagement in under better understanding the nature of the recruitment of the outreach engagement and recruitment methods that are available to us. There is a science called the science of inclusion. It is truly a science in which we have increasingly specified and empirically documented effectiveness with respect to a variety of procedures and practices for outreach, engagement, and recruitment. How do we bring that to bear? And, and the Precision Medicine Initiative was committed to bringing that knowledge and practice to bear in the assembly of that cohort. It also indicated that there were a variety of data considerations and that it, it, its goal was to combine well-proven and innovative methods and technology for data collection with their management, access to those data, and their control. Biobanking, obviously, since the genome was a, a major piece of this, is the collection of the biological specimens in what form, for what purposes, and their storage and, and access heavy um, set of, uh, set of uh, recommendations around policy considerations. As you might imagine, there's a very complicated web of legal um, statutes, regulations, and policies surrounding research in general, this type particularly, data security, privacy, and matters of interoperability among the various electronic health records and the systems that sustain those health records uh, seen as the major source for two of the three legs I'll turn to in a few moments. And lastly, matters of governance, of how to take best practices and governance around the formulation, oversight, monitoring, and implementation of such a complex initiative. Well, suddenly we have burst onto the scene a set of issues that we could have predicted 30 years ago would arise again when not carefully cultivated and addressed. And one of the problems that happened with the All of Us program is that it was slow out of the gate with respect to addressing these kinds of concerns. In term, it was staffed to outreach and to engage Native communities and others, but it did not move quickly enough or, or comprehensively enough. What are the concerns that, um, that emerged? Well, this one in particular, need I tell you who that is, and all of the issues that have surrounded Elizabeth Warren's reference to her own personal background and history uh, as an American Indian person. So it moved us quickly into matters of ancestry testing. This is a huge issue among American Indian Alaska Native people. So I'll come back to that in a moment. As I indicated, we do not necessarily think of ourselves exclusively as a race or ethnicity, but as members of domestic dependent sovereignties, as politically defined in our relationship to the federal government. And so a genetic attempt to define genetically who we are is irrelevant, frankly, from the point of view of tribal membership. I thought that Wilma Mankiller's uh, comment about this, an Indian is an Indian regardless of the degree of Indian blood or which little government card they do or do not possess. You may not know it, but if you're um, 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 a formal member of a federally recognized tribe, just like in the American Kennel Club, I uh, breed, train, and compete pointers and Irish setters in something called field trials, and I have AKC registration certificates, so too members of federally recognized tribes carry something called a certificate of degree of Indian blood um, that is meant, that is basically controlled by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, and it is sort of the membership card, like, you know, you want to go to Costco, well, you want to go to the Indian Health Service, you got to be able to present that card. So. It's these kinds of issues that arise. Who decides and who counts as native? You've got it right here in Lummi, in northwestern Washington. It brings up and evokes these notion of blood quantum issues and the like. So this is, this is the circumstances and the scene in which the All of Us program now emerged. And many of these were not settled um, by NIH. And so we saw the All of Us program was immediately embroiled 
hit a major challenge about ways into which appropriate and respectively reach out to and include American Indian Alaska Native people in their recruitment into this million plus cohort. So, the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Collins, and the leadership in the All of Us Research Program scrambled to address these issues. And part of the response was to establish a tribal collaboration working group. Membership from a variety of different tribes, a variety of different perspectives, of science, healthcare providers, advocates, et cetera, about 15 to 16 of us who came together and met for a year and developed an initial guidance document, which was titled Considerations for Meaningful Collaboration with Tribal po Populations. I'll give you a sense for it in a moment, which was uh, issued in April of 2018, uh, as we saw as the first step in terms of educating the National Institutes of Health, as well as serving as a common reference point for subsequent consultations with tribal entities. What were the basic elements of this? So it articulated overarching principles for engagement with tribal communities. It really required that there be an acknowledgement on the part of NIH and the federal government about matters of tribal sovereignty. It acknowledged the historical transgressions that occurred and that contributed every turn to these conversations and the difficulty. That it recognized the importance of engaging with urban American Indian Alaska Native people, 72% of us live in today's cities and suburbs. And that this conversation be ongoing and bi-directional. There was a specific focus in the document on four areas, again, should be no surprise given this history, on governance, on tribal sovereignty and consent and the implications of that for the protocols procedures and practices, on the ethics around the institutional review boards of biospecimen storage and access and protection and benefits, and lastly, the manner and form and extent and resourcing of engagement and partnerships. Now, this document wasn't by consensus, okay? There, were, there was too much variability among the people who were a part of it. So it was purposely, in the final analysis, not intended to be by consensus because we saw it as simply a launching pad for propagating a formal um, consultation process more broadly nationwide. So what did that process of soliciting input from all of these key stakeholders, formal and otherwise, look like? So it began with a letter that we helped um, Dr. Collins uh, draft. Uh, and it was a, what we call a Dear Tribal Leader letter, which is a classic kind of letter that most government agencies uh, articulate and disseminate to tribal leaders, letting them know that this process is about to be undertaken. It's also formally published in the Federal Register. It was important, too, that it not just be targeted to federally recognized tribes, but to the leaders and key stakeholders and advocates who are at work in our cities. It also indicated uh, in advance its commitment to a tribal consultation process and to listening sessions specific to all of us research program and launched with a major uh, webinar that I'll be talking about in just a few moments uh, that was open to all concern. Now, each of these elements are distinctly different from one another, reflecting the character of the relationship between the federal government and tribal entities. So the first and most formal is the government-to-government -to -government consultation, in which there have been nine government-to-government -government -government consultations that have been undertaken around the country regionally that have brought together literally tribal leaders and formally delegated tribal representatives to presentations about the All of Us Research Program, question and answers about that, a series of recommendations uh, from that leadership about how to proceed and expression of their concerns, et cetera. And you can see here that there's an enormous value on listening more than talking, which we had to frequently remind our federal counterparts of that emphasis. A second form of input was 
less formal listening session in which all of us research program representatives went about the country typically attached to already naturally occurring gatherings, conferences by the National Congress of American Indians, by the National Indian Health Board, the National um, Council on Urban Indian Health, et cetera, et cetera, and would have listening sessions as a part of that, in which members of the these communities, not tribal leaders necessarily, and for the most part not, would come and have an opportunity to voice their concerns, their aspirations, and, um, and the like. The, first, the third was a general open uh, solicitation to the public in general through a classic information um, solicitation uh, through the Federal Registry to a website. Um, and this is how mi the public at large who were not appropriate to uh, participate in the government to government consultation or unable to join the listening sessions provided their input. Basically, this work reflects the frequent uh, admonition that you'll hear from many Native people about nothing about us without us for all of the reasons I've attempted to anticipate. And I think there are a growing cadre of American Indian Alaska Native scientists, graduate students, junior faculty, and more senior people who are stepping up and engaging in appropriate and constructive ways, fellow scientists and these kinds of entities around the issues and how to approach these issues and publishing about it. It's really very exciting. And of course, um, Nana Bog Garrison and um, Katrina Claw are two University of Washington products. Uh, work with uh, Wiley Burke and really remarkable young people advancing the field. So what do I think are some of the scientific challenges? I want to move from process and structure to the scientific challenges of the day for us. The first is this notion of percentage in medicine. From the very beginning, the conversation has placed it on a three-legged stool focusing on genes, lifestyle, and environment. But where is most of the work and attention focused? It's on the genes. One of the biggest challenges we have before us is figuring out what are the appropriate, what are the areas of emphasis in lifestyle and environment? How do we operationalize those emphases? How do we um, develop data and systematic uh, data systems for acquiring th that information in uniform ways? And ultimately, how do we integrate those three? A second major thing comes from our work with the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. There's a real challenge to capturing meaningful elements of the experience scientifically. This is, a, I think, a wonderfully instructive um, schematic that points out that the level of influence with respect to health disparities is at the level of individual, interpersonal, community, and societal, and that the domains of influence that um, beg for our attention are biological, behavioral, physical, built environment, social and cultural environment, environment and the healthcare system. And the NIMHD promoted and has published a general framework. And what we did with this one was populate it with examples from American Indian Alaska Native communities illustrating some of the important ways in which these cells at the points of intersection between the X and Y, Z axes might be populated and should be considered. And they have implications for particularly operationalizing uh, the lifestyle and behavior components. A third major area has to do with varying definitions. There are 573 federally recognized tribes. There are at least 26 def different definitions of who constitutes American and Alaska Native. And I remind you that the tribes are responsible for establishing merit membership based on a variety of different uh, criteria, which may be shared customs, traditions, language, as well as tribal blood that these criteria are embedded and codified within their tribal constitutions and articles of incorporation or ordinances. Two of the most common requirements for membership are lineal descent, or tribal blood quantum, sometimes residency or continued contact with the tribe. So this introduces the notion, if this is a highly heterogeneous group that is not operationally defined in terms of a single set of criteria, 
and certainly include criteria that have little or nothing to do with genetic descendancy, what do we do? What, it, what are the meaningful questions that can be asked of this? And again, Tom Berman and I had, I had a wonderfully instructive conversation with Tom about the challenge posed for us in terms of admixture. And what are the implications of admixture? And how do we focus on admixture and the diversity that's inherent in these kinds of, of, of materials and lines of inquiry? And what are the implications of that for categories of this nature? Another, Deidre and her colleagues have written about this quite eloquently, the nature of small populations. We have a small population science here. Uh, you know, um, most federally recognized Indian tribes are relatively small in number. We only have maybe uh, certainly less than a dozen that are more than 10,000 people. What are the implications of size, dispersion, or accessibility to a tribal population of interest? And what are the um, challenges that are posed for us in terms of generating adequate sample sizes to, to, to test specific research questions? A corollary of that has to do with the rarity of many of the diseases. You know that in the vast majority of instances, much of the success that's cited in regard to precision medicine really are ultimately about fairly rare disorders. Well, if it takes a large population to be able to uh, actually uh, identify a rare uh, condition within that population, what then does pop a small population such as this imply for that work? Also, too, related to this is that most of the statistical methods that we have available to us are suited for large population studies. So the typical kinds of adjustment, increasing sample size, et cetera, et cetera, are often not available to us. So what kinds of new statistical and creative and innovative approaches are required by these circumstances? Uh, <laughs> I've heard this one so many times, no data? Oh, no problem. The, the assumption about no problem isn't a function of the fact that there's no problem. It's frequently a fu function of the fact that there's no data to tell us if there's a problem. And then the last challenge I, I want to bring up is, and there are others, the lack of interoperability among data systems. So as I noted earlier, the, there are three major components to the, urban, uh, to the Indian healthcare system. The Indian Health Service, which is federal, tribal, and the urban Indian healthcare system. It is highly fragmented and very siloed among themselves and with their county and regional counterparts. The healthcare data systems are often archaic and limited. For example, as recently as 2012, an estimated 63% of primary care providers in the ITU system still use the fax machine to communicate with one another and the nature of the, their diagnostic and other kinds of data. And we know that just in the general uh, public that there are dozens of government certified EHR products out there that are being used across this healthcare system that are not interoperable. So how do we address this in order to acquire the data for these other two legs of the stool? I think the answer lies in the journey and that's what we've been on for a number of decades now. And I'm impressed it's the, our younger colleagues who are coming along, who have a keen appreciation for the importance of these issues, are acquiring greater competence around the science by which to pursue those answers to those questions, um, and are more open, albeit within an increasingly sensitive context, uh, to this particular journey. And that's why Deidre, I, and others are deeply invested in supporting and promoting the careers of our young people to come step forward, to be there in providing the guidance, and also to recognize that compromise is a necessary aspect. Uh, it is not something that is, it is within our reach, and that um, there are benefits as well as com a cost to this, but ultimately the challenge is, is understanding the benefits as they may outweigh those costs. That's my presentation. Thank you. We have five minutes for questions, if you like. Could you introduce yourself? 
So the answer varies depending upon where the recruitment site is. So the enrollment sites for the All of Us Research Program are all currently located in largely urban areas, okay? Although some tribes di uh, disagree with this um, approach, the tribe itself has no jurisdiction over its individual members outside of the physical boundaries of its reservation, okay? So it becomes a matter of individual decision. And in fact, to date, there are some six or 7,000 American Indians and or Alaska Natives who have enrolled in the All of Us Research Program as a consequence of simply appearing in the clinic settings in which uh, the sites in question, uh, the enrollment centers in question operate uh, without being actively engaged, decided on their own that this was something of interest to them and they're pursuing it. So tribes have no jurisdiction over them doesn't mean that NIH and the federal government doesn't have a responsibility to them in terms of advising them about the lengths to which it's going uh, and being transparent about the assumptions and the reactions of their peers uh, in tribal communities. If the All of Us Research Program develops, as it's been talking about, pilot projects with specific tribes, it's going to resource likely to resource and engage specific tribal communities to establish enrollment centers within their jurisdictional boundaries. And at that point in time, th all of the uh, institutional review board, community review board expectations, tribal codes and regulations come into play, and NIH and the tribal, and the tribal governments in question will need to figure out how they can live with one another's requirements. So it will be a heavy emphasis on compromise. So we will see whether or not that particular investment leads to um, collaborations on tribal lands themselves. Um, the uh, All of Us Research Program currently has a total moratorium on the active outreach, engagement, and recruitment of American and Alaska Natives into that million cohort. That six or 7,000 um, American and Alaska Natives in the, currently in the cohort were not the product of active outreach and engagement. Um, it's clear that the cohort in order to recruit American and Alaska Natives needs to actively outreach and engage uh, them into the cohort. Best guess is probably late summer of this year. Most of the issues will have been um, addressed and resolved to at least the mutual satisfaction of uh, tribal leadership through the government-to-government -government consultation process. Um, it's not as if the federal government isn't um, facing its own challenge. Uh, legal counsel is uh, debating a whole series of, of issues um, uh, about uh, the tentative agreements. I think probably in the next two to four weeks, the All of Us Research Program will post on its website. Uh, we tried to get it down to 10, but there are 12 commitments. I thought 10 commitments sort of had a nice ring to it. But 12 commitments is going to make uh, to tribal communities and people um, in regard to its approach uh, to these matters and uh, that, will, that will guide uh, in practice as well as principle its, its uh, work in this regard. Asterix, hi. This is a matter of considerable discussion. So everybody initially will self-identify as American and Alaska Native. Then you will have the opportunity in a treat-like fashion to indicate your choice, whether or not you, in, you wish to identify a, a, as affiliated with a particular tribe. A Lot of discussion about who gets that data, okay? What does it mean? Uh, is now the NIH and the federal government have an obligation to the tribes so designated as affiliated as this individual has an affiliation of the person. It is n by no means solved and it is a matter of great, great uh, attention and work right now. Well, I was wondering about privacy and confidentiality. Mm. Thank you. 
treated as kind of involved with research and what are those combinations You went to the Right, exactly. What? It, it seems that there's a lot of collaborative interest in addressing some of the missteps of the past in terms of research, especially for this massive project to represent the country nationally, including all of the you know various tribal groups um, and communities. And so, you know, I wasn't sure if there was conversations about whether to continue involving all tribes, whether or not they're involved or represented by. So all of this research program has committed to continuing this government-to-government uh, -government consultation process and, lis and listening sessions uh, without, without constraint, okay? So there's that commitment. People felt very strongly about it. Um, the uh, the self-identification of American and Alaska Native will ultimately be released um, to uh, investigators. So you have to understand there are three tiers of, inv of investigators. The citizen scientist investigator and all others, there will be a, 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 a data that will be available, but it will have no more than American and Alaska Native in it. The next level down has a whole series of controls over it, and in fact, we've been um, crafting and, and, and arguing, and it looks like it'll be the case, that there will be very specific educational models, modules for investigators at that level, much less the most tightly controlled level, which provides increasingly more specific data about the study participants. So that's ongoing right now, and that's part of the legal counsel issue about how do you reconcile uh, level of access with privacy rights with the rights of the tribes themselves uh, once you move to that second level where tribal affiliation might logically become available. But it's very thorny. Been a fascinating journey. Yeah, um, th there are several common uh, intersecting networks, but they're not all inclusive or universal. For example, many tribes, largely because of resources, history, um, they cede uh, the review of research to the National inst uh, inst IRB of the Indian Health Service, okay? And um, so uh, many tribes uh, will do that. Um, it doesn't mean that, that it proceeds uh, in their ignorance, it's just handled by the Indian Health Service. That's probably the most common one. Um, but when you move into the matter of tribal sovereignty, tribal, tribes are, are very particular about acknowledging not only their own individual sovereignty, but the sovereignty of their counterparts. So it, the answer, short answer is there's no uniform overarching mechanism to do this. Um, so that's why I think this issue of moving beyond self-identified status to tribal affiliation is particularly thorny. And we're hoping that some of the pilot projects that the All of Us Research Program is beginning to explore and hopefully will implement with tribal communities will provide us with some guidance about how that might proceed. But you put your finger on a major challenge. And, you know, I, Tom, you know, it, it would be really interesting if we had our conversation about, you know, the implications of, of, of American Indian Alaska Native as a political and social category rather than a racial ethnic one uh, and what the implications are from the point of view of a medical geneticist about what that implies in admixture. I, I found our conversation earlier today very insightful. We talked about sort of the two pieces of the spectrum. That the scientists and the, and the uh, subjects have to travel. And on the one hand, defining human populations as races is just not happening anymore. There's a general agreement that you can't divide human populations into races uh, and that we're all humans. And the commonality far exceeds separation into racial groups, which doesn't make scientific sense anymore, versus the idea that, oh, wait a minute, if you look at the DNA clusters of different human populations, they do cluster 
<laughs> there are groups that cluster in terms of their DNA characteristics and the differences may be relatively small, but they allow you to cluster. You can look at DNA clusters on a map, and you can say, oh, that's that ethnic group. There they are. So, but it's not a race. So you have to be able to, to move through those two extremes and get people to agree on not talking about races, but talking about DNA clusters that may be important and could be important in terms of personalized precision medicine. Those clusters may respond differently to a treatment option than some other. So you have to be able to talk about that. And one of the ways is to leave behind the term race and start thinking about other ways to define those subpopulations. And Native Americans are a perfect example. And how difficult that conversation is among fellow scientists, if, if uh, you know, much less between the scientific community and the lay public, much less um, you know, scientific administrators. They're very, very complicated discussions. So. Yes. The perfect example being schizophrenia. Yes. You know, that all of us may eventually result in research on mental illness. Yes. I believe it is. The things that they're really, um, uh, that we're really very concerned about are matters of, matters of ancestry. So, um, you know, we, for the reasons I've I identified, we define ourselves in terms of the criteria that are um, adopted by our tribal members. It's not in terms of 23andMe or Ancestry.com or those kinds of things. So people are worried that these kinds of specimens and the, and the genetic analyses thereof will be used for arguments about ancestry. And so um, it, that's a really, really hot issue. Um, and, um, and all of us research programs clear that it will not permit that kind of research. Um, so, and that's also another issue that's being vetted by legal counsel because there's this tension between uh, academic freedom, science, and, uh, and the wishes of uh, the, of the other constituents. But that's an issue that's very important for the yes. to hear yes. and think about ahead of time. Yes. The major issue is stigmatization. You know, how, you know, I don't think Native people in and of themselves are intrinsically opposed to a particular condition being examined if one can make the argument deliberately and thoughtfully that there will be benefit individually and collectively. It's the way in which that condition is examined and the results are disseminated and characterized. Your example with the Volga Germans was a great one. Yeah. Well, it's after five. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you.